Okay, we start then. Uh, hello, everybody. Here we are. We are really excited by this event today, hosting the presentation of a book which I really love, as you can see, <laughs> is a hair story of economics by Edith Cooper. Uh, Edith is professor at SUNY, so at uh, the State University of New York. And uh, uh, together with us today, we have two fantastic discussants, <laughs> Rebecca Gomez Bedancourt from University of Lyon, and Manuela Mosca from University of Salento in Lecce here in Italy. And I hope there are also members of ISP, since Manuela is also the president of ISP, with whom we have organized, uh, so in collaboration with whom we have organized this event uh, here today. So I immediately give the floor to Edith for a presentation and then uh, uh, all the rest will come. Thank you so much, Edith, for being with us anyway. Okay, thank you for inviting me, uh, Martella. I'm really and, uh, glad to be here um, and welcome also to those online. And thank you for uh, Manuela Mosca and uh, Rebecca uh, gomez Betancourt to be here. I really look forward to your commands and to the discussions afterwards. So uh, my book, um, let me see. Oh, I something is not working. Oh, right. You're sharing your screen. I'm stuck. Sorry about that. Let me see if I can get it. Maybe this works. Okay. But then I have to work slightly differently. Let me try this one more. No, this is not. There it is. Okay. Yes. So, oh, quite a lot of gentlemen here. <laughs> yes. So I hope you can see the image. Some people are familiar with it, but um, these are four um, economists, political economists, economists, um, and they say something is missing. Any clues, gentlemen? But uh, my book, this is like an introductory sheet, um, does not address the question of why women have been excluded from economics or from the history of economic thought. What it uh, does, it builds on a collection of women economics texts, women economic writing and the writing of women economists that I brought together in a set of volumes. Um, and I let in my book, these silence voices speak and have an impact on the narrative of the history of economic thought. So we have been taught that only two women made it to the surface of the history of economic thought, right? John Robertson, Rosa Luxemburg, maybe some other names, Harriet Martineau, Jane Marseille, Priscilla Wakefield, but then it kind of stops. I know that a few of you among you know many more names by now, right? But most students and economists, historians of economic thought, this is about it. And uh, the general idea is that this is enough and some say more than enough, right? Okay, so the current narrative uh, that is taught in, his, in courses of history of economic thought, most of you will recognize this as a list of contents of textbooks, right? looks as follows. So it starts generally as, with Adam Smith um, and uh, it, it focuses on England, uh, it focuses on individual, on white middle-class men uh, more in particular, right? These are all males. And generally there is an internalist approach applied in the sense that the ideas that economic thought is considered to be the result of rational reasoning and of rational debates between these individuals. By now, this narrative, what we see here on the screen, has practically become set in stone. Yes, this is what we teach. So the question here is, where are the women? Yes, okay. And what is the impact of taking a gender aware or feminist perspective by systematically including the voices of women, all kinds of women, right? Different color, class, location, into the narrative of history of economic science. So women always wrote on economic topics. So the book goes back to very rather early texts um, and in which women write about their about the economic aspects of their lives, 
of politics, of legislation. Uh, for example, um, a few women wrote, well, quite a few actually wrote about marriage as an economics institution. Yes, various political economists considered marriage as a social uh, institution, more or less, and they excluded it from economic thinking because it was considered pre pre-capitalist institution, right? Okay, so women did not wrote, write in the same genre as political economists, politi um, but they wrote in other genres like account books, diaries, letters, poems, etc. right? So it were these texts that I collected and then used as the basis for this book. Okay, from these texts and from the reading and rereading of these texts, I've drawn the following themes. Nomia and the study of the household, new and gendered morality of capitalism, marriage as an economic institution, there it is again, then disposition of women and an ethics around money, very important uh, for um, feminist thinkers, people active in the women's movement was education, yes. Of course, production, also consumption, government policies and sustainable development. So these are kind of the, the, the chapters in my book. And uh, by linking these, a new narrative about the history of economic thought emerges. Yeah? Rather ambitious, but I think I can kind of do that on the basis of what I found. So let me flesh out a few of these themes in this lecture to give you an idea of what happens to the history of economic thought when you bring women's voices in. Okay, so we start with economia or the study of the household. Yes, and for that, I go back to um, further than Adam Smith and his uh, Wealth of Nations of 1776, but I go back to what's considered the origin of economic thought to the Greek philosophers. And the first text I refer to is that from Xenophon, right? Xenophon is the one who comes up with this notion of oikos, study of the household, etc. cetera. This um, a book, the Economicus, Economicus it's called from uh, 362 BC, is very interesting in this context. So in this book, he focuses on the household as the main units of analysis. And he writes quite a bit, he writes quite a bit about the role of women in the household and the importance of training women to do a good job. Yes, he enters into a dialogue with Socrates and he lets Socrates in conclude that the wealth of a household depends importantly on the training and skills of the housewife. This is a lovely text. Socrates is really funny. So I really, and it's very accessible. So I really recommend people kind of taking this up again and, and give it a good read. So from then on, what happens is that the literature develops around the knowledge of um, managing household, right? Skills, what kind of skills do you need? How are you running a household? Well, so cooking, stain removal, uh, the whole list. And these books are, women are well represented and the authors of these books. And these books were mostly used to train young women to cook, etc., to run her own, their own household and uh, to run whole estates. Um, so over the, um, um, uh, over the over the centuries, uh, these estates become larger and larger, and and by the 17th century can can um, contain whole communities. Right? There's a bakery, there's a brewery. Hundreds of people were living there. So how to run a place like that um, was quite uh, an issue. Okay. Some examples of these texts are um, the account books of Grisel by Bailly of Jarviswood, right, 17th century, early 18th century. She kept books meticulously over decades. And these books have been preserved and there is an abstraction, a summary of those books has been uh, published. I think it's 1911, but uh, the family is uh, kind of thinking about um, revisiting those original documents. Okay. 
And that talks a lot about how to run a household, how to deal with your personnel. You know, there's a lot of knowledge that you can distract about how these communities function. So Griselle was part of the Scottish aristocracy. Um, Mary Collier is a washing woman. So this is one of my favorites. And as some of you may know, this poem, one of my favorite texts, uh, it's a poem that's critical of Stephen, Dosh, uh, Stephen Duck's poem. I would leave that out here. But she describes the day schedule of a working woman. Uh, a working woman um, who runs her household while also working in the fields and during the winter at the big house. So um, Mary was actually exceptional uh, as a, a working class woman. She could read and write. Um, and her mistress uh, published a poem. So it's, it's really, um, we're very lucky to have her poem. Otherwise, it's mostly the text from middle and upper class women that have been preserved, right? And because these women had access to education and access to opportunities to publish their work. The last example that I want to mention here is Mrs. Beaton's Book of Household Management from 1861. Um, and this book is particular because it is still being printed. You can still buy it in the shop. So this, um, uh, and it's been used very intensively over the years for young women who want to learn and run their household. Okay, this tradition of Miss Beaton book for household management later develops into this uh, literature of um, home economics and that runs far into the 20th century. So um, for political economy, what we see is that the route that they take is slightly different. Uh, but even also for political economists, the household remains the central unit for analysis far into the 18th century. Okay. So the second theme that I wanted to kind of talk about today is the dispossession of women. Yes, so Cheryl Chapone is um, an, an early writer who warns women uh, about the um, uh, developments at that time in marriage laws and also for the shift from religious laws and customs towards um, what she calls natural laws um, um, that were kind of propagated by the Enlightenment movement. So, and, and, and Chapone says, I'm, I'm not always clear about how to pronounce these names. Maybe we can talk about that. You know, I did not have personal contact with these people. So, so um, I, if somebody has more certainty about that, I call her Chapone. So, um, and she warns women. She says, okay, these new marriage laws and these natural laws that these new philosophers is talking about, these will work out in a devastating manner for women. And she comes up in her book, The Hardships of English Law in Relation, in relation to Wives. See how early that is, 1735. She comes up with three statements. Yeah, so she states that the estate of wives is more disadvantageous than slavery itself kind of shocking statement. What she had in mind with saying this is that by married, women more or less became property of their husband. But the thing was that they were expected to do that willingly and with a smile. Right? So that was, that was part of the point that she tries to make here. So she also states that wives may be made prisoners for life at the discretion of their domestic governors whose power as we had as it apprehended, um, bears in no manner or proportion to that degree of authority which is vested in any other set of men in England. So she says these, these husbands, they have an outrageous amount of power over their wives. And then as a third, the wives have no property, neither in their own persons, nor over their children or over their future. So she's really in a very dramatic way warning women. English marriage laws as described by Blackstone later on stated that women, stated women as being represented by the father, brother and husband uh, 
under the what is called the covetous laws, right? Um, and that, that set of laws was pretty extreme even in those days. I think that's good to realize that in England, those marriage laws were pretty, pretty firm because it kind of feeds into our economic thinking. In the Netherlands, for instance, where I'm from, uh, education of girls was much more normal. Uh, and the control, women uh, retained control over inherited property while married. So there was, there was different in England, right? Uh, in England, the say was the husband and the wife are one, and that one is the husband. So in other words, we have a family, and there was the head of the house. Yeah. Okay. All the capital that was owned by women was by marriage appropriated by the husband who could spend it as they liked. And I bet they did, right? <laughs> they spent that money. So Adriana Roberts speaks of primitive accumulation in this context. And I'm interested, I didn't get a time to figure that one out. Maybe economic historians can, can, can dive into it. I haven't done an anti literature on the, on the topic. But I'm interested to what extent the appropriated capital by these husbands have provided these men with the adventure or what we call venture capital to support the early capitalist endeavors. Okay. Similar points are made across the channel um, by, for instance, Olympe de Gouge. Olympe de Gouge is a fascinating figure. She um, speaks out during the, she joins the French Revolution um, and she was a revolutionary and she fought for the full citizenship of women. Um, she writes a lot of feminist tracts um, and that actually made her end up in prison. So there she writes this letter to Queen Marie Antoinette, trying to appeal to her experience as a woman and her power position as a queen. So one year before Mary Wollstonecraft's demand, demands the right to vote for women, the Gouge demands the right to full citizenship for women and the right to vote. Also demands, very interestingly, uh, equal pay for equal effort or equal work, right? Um, and the demands, the dem she demands the right for women to get a divorce. These women were really locked up in marriage. They couldn't go anywhere. You know, you were just very unlucky if you married a guy who would spend all your money and hit you around the room, et cetera, et cetera. You literally had nowhere to go. So for Olympe de Gouges, it doesn't work out well because her revolutionary pals, they did not appreciate her feminist publications and activism and they kill her. They sent her to the guillotine. That's the end of Olympe de Gouges, okay. So um, in the United States, um, the um, dispossession of women uh, to some extent takes the form of uh, slavery. Uh, on, and these enslaved women in the United States, they also write. They write diaries, they write texts. Um, here are a few of them. Um, and these texts give a grueling perspective on the economic practices in Southern agricultural, um, economy and also in the more industrial north. So the role of slavery is a form of primitive accumulation that substantially contributed to the industrial development in the US and the wealth of the US has not been really addressed by economists for centuries. So let alone that the that attention was paid to economic experience of women like Sojourner Truth. So um, what then happens is that we see that England start to industrialize. Yeah, um, the disposition of women does not stop with the development of industrialized society and the economic growth that follows. It remains a continuing matter. In addition, however, what we see is that an important part of the industrialization process meant the moving of production from inside the household to workshops and factories, yes? And that under the full control of men. 
of, it's good to realize that background um, and this movement from productive activities from the household to the more public sphere. Okay, against this background, there he finally is, 1776, Adam Smith, the man who gets to be known in economics as the father of the discipline. Okay, in both his theory of more sentiments of 1759, as his wealth of nations of 1776, what he does is he makes a substantial move. Okay, this is something I would like you to take home. This is what I tell you, right? Okay, so this is important. What he does, he models his economic theories after economics, Isaac Newton's theory of gravity. He wants to, he aims to apply this natural law framework to the analysis and the theoretization of the economy. While, he do, he, while doing that, he focuses on man, right? And long time there was a claim that this was a generic term, but that is only uh, to a very uh, limited extent true. So he focuses on man as a rational individual involved in exchange over markets, man as representing women for the law, as women, man as heads of households, and man who is the one who's productive, right? In his preface to the Wealth of Nations, he talked about useful labor and unuseful labor. The work done in the household was by Smith perceived as services or unuseful labor and didn't count as productive. So what he does is um, he wrote how the household and in the household, women, children, and others who live there and who produce there out of economic is theory. So I always kind of make that visible. I say Adam Smith turned his back on the household and he focuses on the head of the household who then maintains economic exchange relations via the markets, right? Um, but we are still facing the consequences of that move today. Okay, back to women's economic writing. There it is. Um, there's a few groups I want to put on the table and there's so much to talk about. So I decided to limit myself to a set of groups and uh, so that, um, uh, still quite a bit of materials covered. And I want to start with the Langham Place group. It was called after the place where they met in London. Um, this is a group of, um, a pretty large group actually, of writers and artists, intellectuals, some of whom focused on economic and political arguments to improve women's social and economic position. So um, they're also uh, politically active and they start really pushing back and, and developing policies and, 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 and legislation to um, improve women's legal position. So they focus on, on the right to divorce, but uh, and they specifically work on the Married Women Property Act. So, and that comes through in 1882. So um, they write about a whole uh, set of issues, women and work, education was really important. It's in the last decade of the 19th century that women get access to higher education. The quality of education, because most resources went to boys' school and not to girls' schools, all, the, all those kind of issues. So Barbara Lee smith Bordichon is another one, if you know how to pronounce that. Bordichon, Bodichon, I, I tried the English version, but I call her Bodichon, is um, access to profession was an important point, but she writes a lot about uh, women and work. And they use um, whatever was available to them. So they make use of the census data to, to back up the arguments. So um, they are in that sense, I think you could call pretty cutting edge. Okay, in the United States, what you see is that there is a Caroline Haley Dahl, who gets really inspired by the Langham Prey um, Place research and their, their, um, their, the journal that they start. And she publishes the book, The College, the Market, and the Court in 1876. One of the points that she really stresses um, is the fact that the wages that women earned were way too low and that they could not live independently on those wages. And because of that, a lot of 
the women that had to live on those wages because they didn't have a, 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 a wage earner, a male wage earner, they would end up living on the street and, and being forced to uh, do sex work, become prostitution. So what we see is there's the family again, right? If the father would fall away and say, the youngsters marry and go live elsewhere, what would happen is that the mother would end up to have to sustain herself to, to, to survive by honest labor or dishonest labor and to um, uh, engage in prostitution. It was bad enough in itself, but then what happens is that um, for economists and, and society at large, they are dismissed as rational persons and as human beings in general, right? And for economists, they totally move out of the picture because in economics, unit of analysis is the head of the household. Yeah? Okay. So another group I wanted to talk about um, comes up a bit later are the Fabians. Okay. So these are London, London, it's London group of left wing, left leaning intellectuals. And uh, members are people like Bernard Shaw, A.G. Wells, uh, William Stanley Jevons was a member, but also um, Beatrice Walter Webb and Sydney, Sydney Webb, who kind of found the London School of Economics, right? Very influential. Um, so um, these economists conduct economic research and theorizing to achieve socialism. And although not through revolution, but through reform. So for them, socialism is the sun on the horizon that kind of focuses their research. So there's a group of women who, um, women members of the Fabians who point at the lack of serious attention for women economic issues. Um, and they start this Fabian women's group in 1907 and it runs for about four years. They're very productive. These are very smart, well-educated women and they have seminars, conferences and they are very productive. Okay, so what we see is that Beatrice Otto Webb uh, publishes this um, minority report. Most of you will be um, maybe familiar with that. She engages in empirical research, for instance, in the project on, uh, by, uh, headed by uh, Charles Booth. Uh, she does a lot of things and she writes this, this small booklet on um, equal pay for uh, women and men in which she indicates that the gender of a worker actually, or determined the level of income, not the amount of work, not the mere marginal contribution, no, the gender of the worker was the main determinant of the wage, and that was, um, uh, she just established that. So Mabel Atkinson comes up with this beautiful article um, about the changes in household models over time, and she analyzes the class division in the women's movement. Really a beautiful piece uh, published in 1914. Elena, Elena Rathbone, in, a bit later, um, is uh, publishes in 1917 about um, trying to explain the gender weight gap. And she says that family weight plays an important role in that. And that again, government should um, develop family allowances. So these are interesting policy uh, proposals that, that get discussed at the time. Elizabeth Lee Hutchins is a member of the Fabians Women's Group, but she's also a member of this, this, this um, uh, group of women that find a place at the London School of Economics and that are economic historians, very interesting group of, of women authors. So Hutchins um, writes the history of the factory legislation. She also writes a book on women in industry. Okay, so let's move to the United States, right? What's happening at the other side of the ocean? I wanted to put a particular focus on Sadie Tanner Mosel, Mosel Alexander. I'm writing a paper about her, so that is kind of also a reason to talk about that. Um, she um, uh, has is the first um, 
uh, African-American person and woman to obtain a PhD in economics in the United States. This is the title, the standard of living of 100 Negro migrant families in Philadelphia and was published in 1921. Due to racial segregation and gender segregation discrimination, she recognizes that there is no career path for her open in economics. So due to racial segregation, what happens is that Black people could not get a job in all these in, 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 in economic departments at the time. So she would have to work at, at a black college, a so-called black college, right? But those were very much dominated by men. So what she decides is to, uh, to go and get her law degree. So over her lifetime, she then becomes very active, influential, and famous in the civil rights movement. So economics kind of loses out on a great scholar. Um, her work is quite amazing uh, in the sense that she goes against the grain in the economic discipline that was at the time pretty much dominated by eugenic reasoning, right? And she, instead of explaining the poverty on the Blacks by base, by, you know, the way and the Black people being uh, people-minded of whatever, which was kind of the practice and, uh, and the economist, she by doing the real basic research, talking to a hundred of these families and, and um, um, reporting on that, the way they budget and, and survive on a very minimum income, um, she explains poverty among these black immigrants in Philadelphia by a lack of education, by a lack of consumer training and by terrible housing situation and by discrimination at the labor market. It's just, this piece, it's available on the internet, you know, it's an amazing read. And this research was cutting edge. Because very soon after that in Chicago, another group of women economists will do comparable work on consumer API. Yeah, so let's move to consumption then. Okay, one more thing about Sadie Alexander is that her work, this work was not published um, in a substantial um, way. Uh, as, until Nina Banks kind of collects all her economic writings. There's, a, there's an article somewhere, but she brings, Nina Banks brings all these economic publications together and that was done earlier this year. So, um, okay. When we move to talking about consumption, um, the group I would like to put in the limelight is uh, the group of home economics at the department in uh, Chicago University. Yes, so there we have Hazel Kirk, who reorganizing, reorganizes the home economics department, uh, makes it more say, scientific, it steps away from this tradition of uh, uh, household management, and she gets a chance to theorize consumer behavior, and she publishes her, her, her book, A Theory of Consumption, in 1923. So where economists at the time develop and limit themselves to price theories, the critique of Hazel Kirk, she says, you know, this guy is, is very surprising. Like Stanley Jevons, he doesn't know a whole lot about a household. This is, this is true. These economists didn't know a whole lot was happening, what was going on in the household, right? So what did they do? They theorized the household by focusing on the head of the household, assuming that his preferences were fixed. And then they look at what happens when prices change in a marginal way and what is the impact on the uh, quantity of goods bought. Right? And then Kirk says, this is too limited, that's price theory. What she does is a much more, she takes a much more comprehensive approach and she includes goal setting for the household, the impact of marketing on consumer choice, uh, on budgeting, she talks about budgeting uh, and about the process of deciding whether to make stuff in the household or to buy it. Who do you cook it? Do you, do you store it? Or do you buy it? So what, what makes you decide what? So her PhD student, Margaret Reed, writes this book about the production in the household, and she defines uh, the production in the household um, as that work that you can hire somebody else to do for you. 
Yes, yeah, very important fact to be come back to that. Elizabeth Hoyt, very interesting. No time to talk more about it. Consumption of wealth, fascinating analysis. So Sofinishva Breckenridge um, publishes quite a bit, um, for instance, on housing, education, poverty. Most of these women economists think and publish within the tradition of American institutionalism. Okay. So 20th century, what we see that is that over the course of the 20th century, the economic position of middle-class women in England and the UK um, changes substantially as they move into the labor market and take up paid jobs. And in the 1960s, women, students enter, uh, and, and women economists enter the economic discipline in a much larger number than ever before. So uh, in their bibliography of women economists until 1940, um, but also in Madden's article of 2002 uh, into the topics that women economists focused on, they conclude that women's research has been concentrated in labor economics uh, and also much more than in male economists. They write about policymaking and about gender equality issues. Okay. I'm getting to the end of, of, of my story. Um, at that point, um, the insights of home economics group in Chicago has been lost in history, in history right? Um, um, people do not remember that. Nobody's looking into that work. Um, and um, um, however, in the 1960s, when all these women come, come, come enter into the economics discipline, uh, it's Gary Becker who brings up uh, these ideas of looking into the household using mainstream neoclassical tools of analysis. Um, it's actually Barbara Bergman, who uh, it's the author of The Economic Emergence of Women. Maybe you already see it coming, Marcella. Um, she, um, Becker claimed that he was a feminist. And then she says, um, oh man, Calling, she writes actually, calling Gary Beck a feminist is like calling a Bengal tiger a vegetarian. I don't think she liked him very much. <laughs> so, but he kind of opens up the field again for economists because he came up with the tools to analyze the uh, household um, as an economic institution. Yes, uh, and he gets a Nobel Prize for his work in 1992. Um, okay, so with an eye on the future, I will wrap up with talking a little bit on about the research that's done on sustainable development. And I cover that here by the terms community, commons, and climate change. So economic, um, writers and econ economists, women economists, have actually been quite original thinkers on that topic. I don't know if people kind of realize that. Um, but there have been pathfinders uh, on issues like pollution, like the use of pesticides, the extortion of resources, the use of the commons, um, women's land use and uh, control of about land, land control, right? Ownership of land and, and, and what that would mean. And, um, and economic theorizing around climate change and modeling for sustainable development. Okay, well, that's it. Um, overall, I'm, I'm positive and excited almost. Yeah, I think I'm excited about what work is currently being done. You know, so much going on. And I really look forward, Rebecca, to hearing about your, your group on diversity and history of economic thought. So maybe you can drop some lines on that. Um, the insights that are being brought about, I think it's really exciting. Um, but I think more, much more, and brave work still needs to be done. So thank you for your attention. Rita. Thank you. Thank you so much, Edith. Really, thank you. Um, so before giving the floor to Rebecca and then to Manuela, uh, I just remind to all the students that are with us uh, that we use the chat uh, to put uh, comments, uh, links, uh, and so on. So please, 
have a look at the chat uh, while our discussants also speak, and you will find some interesting links uh, uh, to uh, to use uh, uh, afterwards. Uh, in any case, the chat will be saved and is available for all of you afterwards. Uh, we have students from different courses here with us, uh, and I thank, of course, uh, the colleagues who invited the students to join us. I mean, uh, Anna Conte, first of all, and, and Giulia Zacchi as well, plus myself, obviously. So, um, Rebecca, the floor is yours now. 10 minutes, please. Thank you, Rebecca, we cannot hear you. No, you have to switch on your, your microphone. Okay. Then you told me 15, so I will try to be to be short, okay? The first things that I want to say is thank you. Thank you for inviting me uh, to, to ask some questions and comments to Edith, and especially, and a big, and a red, red, and big thank you, Edith, uh, for the publication of this book. It was really necessary uh, into the literature. It is very important uh, for connecting people, connecting generation of historian of economic thought, and also to connect people from different societies, different group of research, different part of the world. So really, really, thank you. I love it. I love the book. Uh, I learn a lot. And as you can see, this is part of a recent but very active um, field of research. There are different approaches on women and economics in the history of economics today. Uh, we have big and uh, very um, important basis, in particular, Michelle Pujol, and I have a think of, uh, of her. I really want to organize something uh, for the anniversary of the publication of her book. Uh, but there are collective work also, for example, the Biographical Dictionary of Women and Eco uh, Economists. So the, the things that I saw when I, when I look at all of these books is that they, they have different approaches. Uh, some of them were focused on biographies, others books uh, or articles are very in a specific fields, for example, in home economics or in classical economical school or on feminist economics, etc. Uh, some of them wants to show the contribution of one particular women economies or, or women writing, or some others studying like the research centers, the societies, the journals. And there are, of course, because we have colleagues that are also in other societies as the International Association for Feminist Economic Society that are in between uh, history of thought and uh, also feminist economics are using both. Uh, parallel, and also that the books cover different period of study, and it's true that the, one of the more recently is also on the 18th century, which is Joanna Rostek's uh, fabulous book on the Romantic Age. But there are also very new, uh, more general, of course, not in economics, but more general, that are also, for example, this one in to the left, Blair Imani, that are for uh, women and non-binary people. Uh, and the subtitle is Rewriting History. There are also the, uh, some uh, very new books uh, on um, women and girls from all around the world, and not only United States and UK. And there are also uh, hair stories on feminism. Of course, there are hair stories a lot on the art. I really went to the library because I really need to study all of this. Uh, and uh, what I found the most was hair story on literature, hair story on art, on music, on cinema. So more on the arts parts, but there are more on, on general. So when we look on the maybe the first use of the term hair story, uh, there are a consensus that say that the, it's a start uh, using in 1970, in particular in an anthology that is very short that you can find in internet, that the title is Sisterhood is Powerful, concerning an organization that the letters were which, uh, and uh, Morgan, uh, the author of this uh, pamphlet, this anthology, say, the fluidity and wit of the witches is evident in ever-changing acronym. The basic original title was Women's International Terrorist Conspiracy from Hell. 
but the latest hair and this writing is woman inspired to commit history. So this is one of the first use of the word history in the general history. So the definition, there are a lot of debates. There, the historiography is, is um, short because it's relatively recent, apparently from the 1970s, but it's very rich. So it's a term for history written from a feminist perspective or emphasizing the role of women or told from a woman's point of view. It is originated as an alteration or uh, as we say in French or in Spanish, like a game of words, like you, you, you change the words and uh, instead put his, you put her, and then you only can have this in English because in, in Latin languages, you, you cannot uh, do the game of, of words, but is um, part of a feminist critique of conventional historiography, which is writing as his, Story from the male point of view, from a, his point of view. I found a, a very nice quotation from Bell Hooks, uh, looking for diversity and for other sources. And she wrote uh, in 1999, feminist scholars, uh, and this include black women, were the ones who resurrected her story, well, rest, restate the word in the debates, calling attention to patriarchal exclusion of women and thus creating the awareness that led to greater inclusion. Even though I began my teaching in Black Studies, the course I taught that were always packed with the students were those focused on women writers. The feminist challenge to patriarchal curriculum and patriarchal teaching practices completely alter the classroom. But then the word was also used in a comic way in a serious, so in history department, but also in comic departments. So uh, in comic use, for example, uh, in the t-shirts, in some posters, uh, so in bottoms, but also in academia. And the thing is that, and this is my first question, uh, I forget to tell you, but I have six questions uh, and I put at the end the six, so don't, don't, don't be worried if you forget. The first one, if is you think that uh, this was important in the 1970s and then disappeared of the debates, disappeared of the writings, and then came back recently. Because really, I found a gap in the literature. I found a lot of writings in the 70s, at least in the 80s, but then only in 2019. So the term is a neologism that works only in English, since the word history from the Greek really means knowledge that comes from inquiry. So it's nothing to do with men something or male something. It's come from eotopia. Eotopia, so is look for, look for. It's etymological unrelated to the possessive pronoun. And this in, is in James Mill's woman's work. So there are some criticism. And this is my second question. One of the main criticism at the time is that um, this woman, Christine Hoff, Summers wrote this book that was very famous uh, at that time, Who Stolen Feminism? And she said something that is very common huh, among feminists. She said, uh, she argues that there is a split between equity feminism, what she call, and what she calls gender feminism. Summers contend that equity feminist seeks equal legal rights for women and men, while gender feminist seeks to and her story wants this to counteract historical inequalities based on gender. So like a counteract of the, of the history. Second main criticism is uh, from Devin Losser. He said that, or she said, I don't know if he's a woman or a man, but uh, this person said that the concept of her, her story was overlooking, overlooked the history made before 20th century. So for example, uh, um, all the hair story are contemporary hair story. And now we know that it's not true because there are a lot of hair story on the 18th century and even before. The third criticism is that the word history has not been influenced by the male pronoun. And, and this is only works in English. The fourth criticism, and this is, I share this one, is that hair story suppose a binary between women and men pattern of thinking. And this is one of the criticisms that, that you uh, edit, you also address to history of economic thought, the traditional history of economic thought. 
So do you know any other criticism to history? And if, if you have any answer to this one. Then I, I, I have the impression, reading in particular your, your um, uh, acknowledgments and your introduction, because this is very, this is a very sensitive story because it's very personal, because it's a hair story. So a lot of the author is there, a lot of hair edit keeper life is there. Uh, uh, so it, this is very, very personal and very engaged research. But I also we have two minutes, eh? two minutes left. Wow, okay, okay, I go fast. I have the impression that uh, you have many motivations and I agree with all of this, but my third question to be very fast is, you say in page nine that this book focuses on the work of cis women. Uh, why? Why your history cannot include, for example, the work or the Dieter McCloskey? Then uh, about the outline, I found very interesting because it's thematic. And, and my question is, my fourth question is, how to avoid that the students and not professional historian of economic thought do not mix the period and the context after reading the books? Because for example, in the chapter four, you jump from Jane Austen to financialization in India in 2000. So how we can avoid this for example, if we use your book in a course, as is my case, I would like to use in the second semester, what are the role of the places, the context, the interaction in each period of study? I'm almost at the end. Uh, my fifth question is about the intention of hair stories. What plays, what role for hair stories in economics? What are the audience, audience the public that you want to attract? Is historians, are economists, uh, do you think it's a good way to keep a dialogue with colleagues, with new generation, with young people? Can we bring some feminist economists, for example, to our society, to AISPE, to ALAPE, to GIDA Association, et cetera, through this kind of history that uh, are engaged? And um, two more slides and I finish. Uh, some small criticism. There are a lot of works uh, that are not quoted in the book, and in particular from young scholars. And I put here an example of one, two, three, four, six, but there are many more. Uh, in particular, Simona Pisanelli, Virginie Gouverneur, David Philippi, Francois Sorassi, Charlotte de Chapelin, Guillaume Ballet, Juliette Blayac, and they are working on this. They are in France, they are in Italy, they are in Latin America, they are, and they are very active in societies in history of economic thought. There are not footnotes in the, in there are not too many quotations. And you know, for historian, this is super, super important. My last, very last question is for the future, your, uh, your perspective, what do you suggest to us to organize writing workshop, uh, to know how to write better history, hair stories of his uh, economic thought, organize podcasts, writing more biography, to do as we used to read Ricardo's Mi Nana, uh, to do with women, um, to do more biographies. And in here, I resume the questions that you cannot, uh, then I think it will be easy for you. Thank you very much again for your- Thank you, interview. Rebecca. You can leave these slides on because Manuela doesn't have slides. So at least I did can also think about them uh, while Manuela is speaking. So Manuela, now the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for the very rich- uh, Thank you, Marcella. So you don't see me, right? Yes, we do. We see oh. you. Oh, because yeah. I see the slide. I, I, just... can, I, can, I can stop and then I can put again. Yeah, yeah, but oh, in no, any no. case, we could see you, Manuela, because you are uh, actually <laughs> among the others, uh, but as, as you like, I mean, yeah, yeah. Otherwise, okay. we put the slide afterwards. Okay, so thank you very much, Marcella, for this invitation, first of all, and thanks also for this collaboration between uh, Minerva Lab and uh, the Italian Association for the History of Economic Thought. I think we will have uh, occasion, more occasions in the future. And uh, above all, thanks to Edith for her beautiful, important, innovative book. We finally are starting to have a canon for our her story of economic thought, a new canon based on uh, recurrent themes present uh, in the economic writings of uh, women of the past. I, I decided to 
to skip some notes because I, I, I thought I had 15 minutes to. Anyway, uh, edit book, edit books, uh, edit book gave me the opportunity to think more deeply about some questions that interested me from the beginning of my research on this topic, which is rather recent. So I started a few years ago. And uh, in this comment to her book, I will follow your edit encouragement to explore further and to make new investigations stimulated by your book. So the first question is, uh, is it that came to my mind is, uh, is it possible to write a uh, her story of economic thought exclusively populated by names of women? So instead of having uh, the usual uh, um, traditional uh, uh, list of names, uh, uh, is it possible to substitute that names with just uh, women, names of women? Now, after you know, some thoughts, my answer is no. And I find it confirmed in Edith's book, then you will see if I am right. Uh, because women confronted themselves explicitly with the, the thought of men economists. And in your book, Edith, I found, uh, um, sorry for the pronunciation, we just don't know the way they pronounced their name. So, uh, Emily du Châtelet translated Mandeville, Mary Collid referred to Mandeville too, Elizabeth Montagu, Sophie de Grouchy, Priscilla Wakefield, Charlotte Elizabeth Donner referred, translated uh, Smith, uh, Maria Edgeworth corresponded with Ricardo on rent, Beatrice Potter Webb and Charlotte Perkins uh, Gilman followed Spencer's uh, uh, ideas. So uh, as you write, uh, and I quote, quite a few of them commented on, translated and engaged with the work of the male academic economists of their time. So the point is why? And the, and the reason for me, but I would like to know your opinion, the reason is that the, the, the names of the women were not transmitted. So they were seldom mentioned or cited. They, they, the, women did not cite themselves. We have to look into the archives in order to find the links between them. Their intellectual legacy is hidden. It's, it's our task is up to us to find them. It's not in the printed material that, that we can find the, the, the reciprocal quotation. So, um, Maybe this is one of the reasons why, as I quote, but is very common knowledge that they were famous in their time, but they have been ignored afterwards because they were not cited, mentioned, uh, quoted. Um, moreover, Edith uh, doesn't ignore men's contribution. Uh, she, she speaks about uh, Mandeville on, and Smith on morality, Bentham on gender equality, Malthus on birth control, Jean-Baptiste Say, and so on. And women economic writers reacted to these uh, voices. And I ap appreciate uh, their presence in Edith's book. They were part of the women's economic culture. So they belonged to their point of view. And, and, and it is simply realistic. So I would like to know your opinion because at the beginning I, I said, maybe we can write a totally alternative history of economic thought. Actually, no, because women didn't transmit their ideas. Not explicitly, not explicitly for, 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 for reasons that are very well known. However, with this awareness in the background, it's very precious when we find lines of women transmissions of knowledge from woman to woman through generations. And Edith tracks down many examples of transmission. Uh, Cartwright dedicated her work to Elizabeth Montagu. Her, her term also uh, Chapon, Chapon <laughs> was the daughter-in-law of Sarah, of, of Sarah Chapon 
Caroline uh, Helly Dahl was influenced by Barbara Bodichon, Mary Pelly Marshall mentioned Beatrice Webb. Many started schools, so they had pupils. So there is a transmission. Jane Haldeman Marset was probably influenced by Mary Wollstonecraft, and I have more example. So it's, it's uh, so important to trace these uh, very rare uh, lines. It's, it's up to us to, to discover these uh, lines of trans this, this, um, traditions. Uh, I also appreciated her attention to networks and association. We had some example in the slides, like the Langham Place group in London and the Fabian Women's Group, but she speaks also of the Blue Stocking Society of uh, the Mary Astell's Friends Group and the, the, the Sunday School Movement and the Low Lowell Female Labor Reform Association. So we know the importance of uh, associations and networks. Uh, networks are important uh, and they are important in two respects, uh, I think. One for the impact, for, for, for power. To have power when you, have, when you don't have the right to vote, for, to, have, to, to make a political pressure, you need a network. So from the point of view of, uh, of no, um, uh, Rebecca um, uh, quoted uh, quote the title of sisterhood is powerful. No? So a network is, is a way to, to, to make political pressure. But the second respect it is uh, that the network is very important for us for the problem with the sources with sources. So Edith says that to discover the women, we need to look to the context. And, and I agree, I totally agree. Networks are in the context. With, a, with an internalist approach, you never pay attention to the context. And without the context, you cannot trace the network. And without the network, you cannot discover the names as they didn't publish. So you need the network in order to to find their names. So I, I am very interested in your opinion about that. Then Edith asked, where are the women? This is another point. Um, it was also in her slide. In her book, she mentions and analyzes the economic thought of almost 100 writers, which is a huge amount of names. Uh, she, she just said that they wrote novels, pamphlets, poems. Of course, they were not academic. And uh, she, say explicit, she explicitly says that in her book, she is interested in those who wrote. So it is explicit. But we all know that behind the, the women who wrote, beyond the women who wrote, there were many others who acted without writing. And so our challenge is to try to reconstruct their economic ideas through their actions, to deduct their thought from their experience. And even if she says that she's all, only interested in those who wrote, which is just a lot, which is just an enormous innovation, uh, she also uh, uh, mentions some cases of uh, entrepreneurs, women in finance, business women, bankers, school founders, school founders, they were entrepreneurs in, in another way. And these women who didn't write are even more invisible. And for us, there, there is a lot more to reconstruct. What do you think? So I go a little bit beyond your book, but it is a, so another, the, my last point of going beyond your book is about the Anglo-Saxon uh, perspective. So the book, as you said, is focused on women who mainly lived in England, in France, in France, of course, in the Enlightenment, and in, in England and in the US. Now, it's up to us, non-Anglo-Saxon historians of economic thought, to extend the analysis to other geographical areas. I, I am glad to tell you that a special issue of economia is forthcoming on diversity within Europe. In, uh, in, um, it is called something like Women, Economic and History, Diversity Within Europe, where there is a lot uh, that comes out from different realities in Europe. 
And then I cannot avoid uh, mentioning a research uh, uh, that is on a research project that is, in, that is on in, the, in Italy, on the Italian women economists uh, from uh, Enlightenment to 1950. And it is also in uh, progress. And, and I can tell you that many other invisible women are emerging uh, thanks to these researches. So besi besides everything else, Edith's book is uh, an encouragement to explore further, to explore the, this topic in other contexts, in other dimensions. It's an encouragement to follow her example. So I'm so grateful for this book. Thank you, Manuela. Thank you so much. Uh, we also hope to get funding huh, for our projects in Italy. Of course, yes, right. yes, <laughs> we keep right. uh, fingers crossed about that. Um, so, um, Edith, uh, we have already some questions. Uh, I will add them to all the many questions that you already received. And then I will leave the last uh, 10 minutes just for you for answering. Unfortunately, the timing uh, okay. uh, for our seminar uh, doesn't allow us to have too many questions. Uh, but first of all, David Filippi, that was also mentioned by Rebecca and is here with us. Uh, he wanted to ask a question to edit or make a comment anyway. And then Julia Zakia. David? Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah, right. yeah. Um, Thank you yeah. for joining us, of course. I'm super happy to be here. Um, um, I I ordered the book, uh, so well I'm done. Waiting, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> I'm waiting. I'm waiting for it. So I'm really looking forward to reading it. And um, I wanted to to ask you how exactly did you um, do you think of uh, organizing the book? Because of course there's uh, um, there's been books on uh, uh, women in in, in economics. Uh, um, on specific themes like consumption, uh, how did you? Um, I mean, uh, I I remember the book by Nancy Forbes uh, that Rebecca mentioned in her slide, uh, greed and lust. Uh, I'm forgetting a, a word, maybe, but um, I mean, yeah, this one exactly, greed, uh, lust, and gender, which is a great book. Uh, and um, I wanted to know what was what were you um, um, how. How did you frame the way you were going to to approach um, this theme? Uh, because in my from what I from what I understood here is that you um, you really uh, um, make it a, a bigger framework. Uh, looking at the table of content of content, uh, focusing on production, consumption, distribution, um, and yeah, I wanted to know uh, how exactly. Did you did you do that? Uh, th thank you, thank you so much for the presentation and the comments. Thank you, thank you, David, uh, um, Julia, and then I see also a question by Carlo Di Poli afterwards. Julia, please very quickly. Yes, I will try, and I already have my book here, and so really thank you, Eddie, <laughs> because it's a wonderful book. So we are really happy that you are here. But I mean, let me first of all say that also uh, coming from the comments of uh, Manuela before, I mean, we have to look at these women all around the world. I mean, we are trying to do it in uh, in Italy, but um, how we can do it? I mean, here there are a lot of students. So, which are the, the sources that they can use, where they can find uh, these uh, uh, women if we if they want also to embrace this. Uh, a uh, way of uh, shedding some light on some hidden figures in the history uh, of economic thought. And my second point is uh, uh, more connected to your part on uh, consumption. And it seems that uh, there has been a switch in the history, in the interest of uh, women in economics uh, from more theoretical, so from models to more empirical. So. Uh, a search for statistical, for having more data, for collecting data, for analyzing data. And this is something that we can find also today. I mean, if we look at our professions and the divisions of, uh, if you want labor insight and interest in uh, our profession on a gender point of view. So I was wondering if you have any idea of why 
we have this transition from uh, theory to empirical work uh, for women economists in that period. And also mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Carlo, please. Yeah, well, uh, very quickly, the same as I wrote already in the chat. Well, so first of all, I edit and uh, for everybody, do buy the book because it's very interesting. So also do read it, not just buy it. Uh, my, <laughs> my question is, one of the main, uh, you know, interesting findings that I that I especially liked in the book is the vast range of topics that women have been, you know, uh, discussing over time. But I wonder if this is not partly also a result of our own tradition in the history of economic thought, in the sense that maybe we have also excluded men who have dealt with, you know, different topics than usual. Thank you, Carlo. Thank you for being so quick also. Uh, so I don't have other uh, questions in the chat. Uh, I wonder whether Attilio, Attilio Trezzini, wants to ask a question since he worked on consumption as well. Attilio, you have a question? No, no, I, I just like to thank all of you for this very interesting uh, um, meeting, but uh, I have uh, still uh, much to learn from you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, come on. Your paper is excellent. <laughs> well, <you>. anyway, <laughs> in the meantime, uh, also Eric Aloe, another member of Minerva Lab, just uh, said thanks to Edith for her presentation. So um, if there are no other questions, it doesn't seem so to me, uh, please add it. The floor is yours now for reacting to the many stimuli that you received. Yes, thank you all. Great questions, great comments. Um, I'm not sure I can get through all this, but just let me uh, uh, try. Um, I really enjoyed Rebecca's remarks on this term, her story. Um, I learned a lot because I hardly didn't know anything. <laughs> I chose the word history because actually we used it in our uh, edited volume out of the margin. So that's 1995. So that also answers a later question that you had. Um, and um, it, it, it pops up. Right. If you write, want to write about women, you think about the history of economics. It's kind of so. At some moment, it kind of enters your brain. Um, um, I have to still kind of think about this critique. I think it's it's part of it is playful, right? You say, well, this is not this is not um, um, language technical uh, responsible behavior. <laughs> I think well, then you've done a better joke. Right. Um, I think it also uh, talking about these two concepts like gender feminists and equity feminists, um, it really asks, it immediately asks the question, okay, what about history? Is history not automatically all men's perspective? And that is like feminist economics, by using that term, you immediately question the mainstream. And that is what I like. So you don't have to explain a whole lot anymore because everybody kind of knows what's going to happen, right? So in that sense, kind of it's 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 um, um, declares revolution at, in, in in those. Things. So um, let me see um, why that is one really strong point that 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 I'm kind of still struggling with and I want to work on. Um, why focus on cis women is uh, I wanted to talk about these basic concepts around gender. And I realized that, you know, cis women and women is a very recent term, but I wanted to acknowledge that uh, there are um, non-binary uh, people that have written about economic issues. Um, I didn't include, as far as I know, I didn't include that one, that, those, those writings, I don't, I didn't dive explicitly into the writings of, uh, of uh, gender fluid individuals. I know there are some in the history of economic thought, but I didn't make it focus in the book. And that is because it is, it's already so, you know, there's already so much that that, uh, that is for me I, for a later, later moment. And I know that that is kind of traditional, right? So, so I'm aware of that and, and, and I see the problem. 
Same thing about the focus on English and American texts and some French texts. Um, what I said is I was interested to kind of question the emergence of political economy. And, and that is, uh, I've looked at some Dutch texts because the Dutch kind of, you know, dominated economic thought before the English because they had a hegemony, a hegemonist economy at the time. But it, there is also still a lot that I can do and that we can do there. Right, so, so there is some interesting writing in, in Holland and that I considered including, but then I have to translate it in English. I need a, a professional translator, stuff like that. There are very old 1700s economic songs of two very early poets, women poets in the Netherlands. You know, economy silicus about a woman who says goodbye to her son and say, I raised you well, and now you make a career for yourself. So there is beautiful stuff, but it really, you know, needs to be brought to the surface. And, um, and that is where a lot of work needs to be done, because there is no register of economic stuff that women wrote, because that is what we have to do, right? And that's really kind of figuring out who are the important writers and they probably wrote on economic issues, there's a way to go, and then see uh, references and, and, and look further. It's also a matter of luck, you know, what, what, what pops up. So um, let me see. Uh, the issue that you mentioned about students being con confused about these jumps in the book. Yeah, you can see that in a negative manner that it might confuse students. It does that, right? The book, kind of through the book, you have these chronological lines, and then I start later in the next chapter, and the chronological line shifts and ends later. So, in some extent, I retell the story of these periods again and again to some extent. So there's some repetition there. But you could also say, okay, that is a way for students to learn, right? That they that they recognize people and periods that they that are now discussed, but on a slightly in a slightly different manner, focusing on a slightly different theme. So that is, um, and the text is meant as a complementary text to um, history in, of economic thought textbook. I'm, I'm, I'm really interested to see the experience of people who take these, uh, you know, a standard economic textbook and history of economics, because the history of economics is also very critical about the history of economic thought. But I think that could work very well, right? It really forces students to think about what happened and what, what is the place of the history of economic thought? Because the history of economic thought has not, coming back to what Manuela said, has not been innocent. They have, um, there is this tradition of excluding women. Uh, and, and then, you know, even today, when they make a pack of cards of economists, starting with Adam Smith, do you ever think that there's a woman in that pack of cards? You know, the representation has gone back from 10% to 2%. So these, you know, graves of, of economists, um, calendars of uh, economists, there hardly ever is there a woman except for Joan Robinson and, and maybe, you know, recently Harriet Martino. So there is not a layer at which women have been excluded. It's like a third layer, right? They've been pushed aside out of the economy and then you get pushed aside in writing. And then when it got so famous, like for instance, who did I mention? Um, Sadie Alexander, she was bloody famous. She became the woman of the year, mind you, right? And we don't know her as being economist. And then you have Harriet Martineau who was so terribly famous and she was very rich because of her writing. We didn't know about her until like five years ago. So, um, Somebody else. Um, well, there are several experience, um, uh, examples of that. So, um, which is which is embarrassing. So, why is that? Um, I'm I'm fascinating by the way, fascinated by the way that the male economist's mind works and how. I don't know. It seems so self-evident to not refer to women's work. 
And um, I think that doing this book and other books, one of my, my kind of conclusion is that the notion of science kind of emerged. And one of the characteristics of science is that it had nothing to do with women. Right? That made it scientific. It's very sad, but I think there's an aspect of that. So um, uh, let me see what else can I can I talk about. Yeah, you're totally right, Rebecca. About um, I didn't I didn't made a full effort to reference modern work currently done, also work on on various persons, um, and that kind of addresses also um, Philippe's uh, question, how did you go about building this book? Um, I wrote my thesis, I wrote my master's thesis as an exploration of feminism in economics. So just all, what, what books are there? You know, what can you do? And then I made a thesis in which I built a structure of how to analyze gender in the history of economic thought. And I came up with, you know, with these over, overlapping periods in which some concepts are put, are, are we survive in economics, right? But the, the separation of public and private that's installed in the 18th century, that's naturalized. And uh, then the redefinition of science happens in the end of the 18th, 19th century. But this notion of public and private is, is um, remains in place. The notion of production remains in place. The notion of consumption remains in place. But a whole lot of things change. In order to analyze the fundamental role of gender in the development of history of economic thought requires to, to do really a comprehensive historical analysis taking the context into account. Okay. I hope you get a feeling of the headaches I had about this topic. It's really, it's really you know, so, and then I had this thesis and his thesis is a thesis. And I thought, I'm not gonna write a book, a full academic book about this because that takes me 20 years of my life. And then, you know, this is just too big an endeavor. So, and I was invited by the uh, editor of um, Quality Press and he said, why don't you write a textbook for undergraduates? I think, oh man, I can kiss you. This is the way to do it. This is the way to do it. So I now can kind of, you know, go back to the material, have, um, do what I do and, and let these women speak and, and see what comes out of it. And that's what I did. It, you, to some extent you can experience, uh, compare it. It's maybe a firm, but you know, to grounded theory in anthropology and sociology. So you go to the texts and then you read the text and then you see what comes out of it. Right. So, um, and um, and what I did is, um, uh, so I focused on English and French American texts. I read these texts. Um, I know my history of economic thought. And um, what I wanted to do is to kind of stick with some basic economic concepts. Do not get too far out of the way, right? If I would make a history of economic thought book talking about only women's issues, it would become a comp complementary book. Only talking about the uh, economics of the family, about education, about consumption, that kind of confirms these, these, these stereotypes about women, right? No, I wanted to go for the core content in the history of economic thought and show that women also wrote about these issues only differently. So I think that kind of strengthens the book and what it can do. So um, um, let me see. About Julia's question about more women being more empirical, I think that is, that is an interesting one. That is something that I kind of noticed uh, in the fact that, that women tend to be more empirical and men through the, throughout history of economic thought tend to be more you know, mathematical modeling theory. Um, I think that, that um, I, don't, I don't say that, I don't believe that women cannot do the modeling or anything, but, but um, when you want to tell a story that has not yet been told, you need to get your data straight. So you need the facts. And that's what you also see is when feminist economics comes up, very basic first endeavor is to find out how many women have been 
unemployed? Where do women work? In which sectors do they work? All these data, they were not collected by you know, dominated uh, census bureaus, right? Women have to do that economic basic research, like also uh, Sadie Alexander does. And that, you know, and they, this is a lifetime work. So they don't get to doing the modeling and the theorizing and the fancy stuff. Right, so so that is how how I understand that. Um, let me see what else we have. Um, how much time do we still have? We have another half hour. Well, or are we done? Actually, the time is finished, so I can give okay. you one more minute. <laughs> okay, let me respond to Carlo. Um, thank you, Carlo, for your phrase on the book. Really appreciate it. Um, and you say, okay, economics um, might just be considered too narrow. I agree. Um, and what I think you're talking about is it's also narrow in the sense that working class perspectives are not represented either, right? But there's more, more work on that recently. Over the 70s and 80s, that was kind of, you know, very much at best. And what I say is that this narrowness is not innocent. It's not, oops, we forgot to talk about that. This, is, this, this narrowness, this specific narrowness goes back to centuries of sexism, racism, if you want, uh, and classism. So, uh, and I think that unraveling that, for instance, what, what was, you know, I learned a lot writing this book, things that I never thought would come out. So this whole field of, of consumption economics, it was, I, my, my jaw dropped. Like, wow, this is, you know, and of course, of course, these women knew much more about it and wrote about it, beautiful stuff over there. So, um, um, and, 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 and um, I lost my train of thought. So it's, that is, that is, that comes out, these connections come out when you, when you look into it, but also you have to go back, uh, way back to, uh, and that's what I wanted to say. It, we may kind of um, realize uh, that things are economics, which um, uh, we knowledge which we lost. For instance, the economic role of education. Education has uh, been enormously important for economic growth and development. Where is the role of education in neoclassical economics, except as an object, except as a variable, as human capital? Right? But in only the utopian economists brought in education as an important aspect of economic development that gets lost. Marx kind of doesn't really kind of bring that in a substantial manner. And, and I think that there's a bit of a gender thing there that, that and because women were the one that raised younger children, um, they were, they started schools, they thought about education. That was something that economists historically over the years, you know, ah, ah, they want to talk about the role of, you know, amazing children. I don't think so. I think it's not good for my career. Uh, so, so these considerations have played a role. And when we kind of take that back, we can look afresh to the role of education. We can look fresh about the role of land in economic thinking, right? And, and many other things. So I, and I'm so happy. Thank you very much for your comments and for, I'm just really excited that all these questions and that you want to keep working on this, you know, that's why I wrote the book, actually. Yeah. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you so much. You. We will certainly do uh, as we always did in a way or in another, also together in the past. So um, I invite all the members of Minerva Lab to join me in video because I would like to thank uh, Edith and Manuela and Rebecca collectively to be uh, here with us today. Uh, don't be shy, switch on the video. And uh, here we are. <laughs> so some of them are coming now. Here we are. So Chiara and so on. Uh, Claudia, uh, Erica, Carlo, Giulio had already left, but he was thanking you for, for being with us. Uh, Jacopo, please switch on, Virginia, uh, uh, and so on. Anyway, so thank you so much, Edith, and uh, I stop now the, the registration, just reminding to all of you that uh, the recording will be available on YouTube, Minerva Lab channel, 
and of course keep on joining us for the next uh, seminars uh, and uh, let's keep on struggle for uh, giving women voice not only in economics uh, but in the society bye thank you, thank thank you so much bye -bye. thank you edith and rebecca and everybody it was